morning, I mean, good afternoon, St. Lucia. Um, I am so honored to be here today, and it's a very exciting time, listening to all the presentations from everyone, listening to all the activities and the creativity and the inventions that are happening at the moment in St. Lucia. It's indeed um, the right time to start talking about. So how can you really protect your inventions, your creations, and uh, hopefully monetize some of that? So I'm very thankful for Giles to connecting with uh, PIPA, my organization, about a year ago and inviting me to be part of this uh, knowledge fair this week. I would like to start um, the session by uh, talking about a um, folktale that is found in many cultures, which just reminds people of a basic truth about the human mind and people in, di in different places. So it's the tale of a mouse that is tired of living in the hole. And it goes up to the surface and it looks around and it looks at the sun. It sees the sun in the sky and the, the sun is like the most beautiful and powerful thing that it sees in the world. So it goes to see the sun and it asks, sun, wow, how can I be just like you? And then the sun says, because I want to be powerful also and be happy, right? So the sun says, Actually, you know, I'm really not the most powerful. The cloud always comes and covers me up. So the mouse goes to the cloud and then the cloud says, mm, no, the wind blows me away. And then the wind says, actually, no, because the mountain stops me. And then the mouse goes to the mountain and then the mountain says, well, I am not the most powerful because the mice that are eating my sides are actually the most powerful ones. So all that journey basically reminded me, the mouse, that it already has the power to be as happy and successful as it wants to be. So I wanted to start this with this because really um, St. Lucians already have um, a lot of the energy, the creativity, the um, inventive spirit. The only thing that they need from this presentation and from the assistance that my organization may bring is some more technical assistance and tools that could be of use. So uh, I also wanted to just remind people a little bit about the law, which is basically that um, the law is very much tied to people's society and lives. Uh, the law helps people make the kind of life and country that they want to live in and the law is actually made by the people, for the people, through the leaders and legislators that you choose. And therefore, although we talk about a certain type of legal system, the, reali the reality of it is that there are a lot of opportunities for the people to really both interpret and operate how it really works uh, in real life. And if it doesn't really work, then there are also options to make small changes. So when I, when I present you um, IP law, it's not completely rigid. There, you know, there will be flexibilities and ways to, to work around it. Um, all right. So the first thing to understand about intellectual property is that uh, there are so many um, different types of intellectual property and basically because there are so many types of creations and inventions so you have uh, intellectual property IP for scientific industrial um, inventions and some of it includes plants you have copyrights that are usually that are usually used for creations that are artistic you have trademarks that are used for businesses and then um, whenever I think you want to sell or transfer certain products. You also have GRs, TKCs that are um, used for traditional knowledge, genetic resources. And then not everything is protected. I mean, you also have a lot of things that belong to the public domain, which basically is a different set of um, knowledge and skills that are not owned by anyone in specific, but just owned in general. So, if you invented something scientific, technical or industrial, like a machine or a new drug for uh, treatments, or even the process of using the machine of a new drug, and um, 
So for that kind of uh, invention, you would use a patent. A patent is basically a right that your government gives you to have exclusive right to develop and exploit your invention for a limited time, and usually it's 20 years. In Central Asia, it is 20 years. S during that time, you are supposed to have uh, the monopoly on that uh, invention so that you can make a profit that will give you the incentive to um, invent more in the future. S um, yeah. And in exchange for that, for that exclusivity, then the deal is basically that uh, there is going to be, as part of a patenting uh, application process, is that there's going to be disclosure of a knowledge, the new knowledge that was discovered, so that other people can look at it, and then they can figure out is if, um, I mean, what is the current state of innovation, and they can learn from that as well. The information that is shared in, in a public database on patents in the country is going to be used to, when you do patent research, to look at, is your invention really new? If it's not, then you cannot patent it, but if it is, you will be able to go ahead and patent it. Uh, so it, it, has, it has purposes to have that data, basically. In the event that you cannot, I mean, you may not want to patent because patent is expensive. Uh, so in some cases, people also use trade secrets for uh, certain inventions. But usually you can only use trade secrets if you are confident that nobody will be able to replicate your invention. Meaning that if they take it apart, the way that um, Carlos was talking about this morning, or you do a lab analysis, you are not able to figure out what is the special formula of a process, of a special step that, uh, that makes um, the creation what it is. And that would be a trade secret. For the trade secret to work, you have to take positive steps to keep it a secret. It has to add economic value to your invention. And so those are the requirements for that. And for example, an exam um, a very famous example of trade secret is Coca-Cola. The fact that Coca-Cola has existed for all these years, nobody has ever been able to replicate it, and nobody has ever leaked the secret of the Coca-Cola formula. For an invention that is uh, more of um, a creation, so like a book, music, a painting, or a sculpture, and if you have fixed that creative expression of an idea, meaning that if you have printed the book or you have recorded the music, either as notes on paper or, on a, or even in a, like in a video, if you made the sculpture into an actual thing, um, or if you actually painted the scene that you saw, then you have copyrights over that artistic expression. You cannot copyright an idea, but it's the expression of the idea. And I guess the way that I have explained that is that everybody sees the sun, but people take you know, different pictures or make different paintings of the same sun. The sun is not, patent is not copyrightable, but the idea of watching the sun is copyrightable. Um, so both patents and copyrights actually have time limits. And copyrights in St. Lucia have a 50 years time limit. Then, trademarks and GIs, as discussed before, basically they're used to distinguish products. You may have the same product, but maybe your product is better than the other product. And you want people to know that. So in order to do that, you put a word, uh, a sign, a color, a shape. And nowadays, people even use a sound. So when people hear a sound, they know that it's your product. It's, it's an IP tool usually used with business strategies so that uh, you will have more people buying your product as opposed to other products. And that implies that your product is better than the others or it's different from the others. And so when people buy your product, um, they know what they're getting. It's also part of consumer protection to make sure that consumers are not going to get uh, confused about what they, what, they, uh, what they get. 
And with trademarks, it's, it's a private IP. So it's usually privately owned by companies and they have to be enforced privately. It also has to be enforced um, routinely. If you don't enforce it, then other people will be free to use it and you will lose the exclusivity over your trademark. In Central Share, you also have geographic indications. I mean, indications, yes. Geographic indications are really more of an IP tool from the EU, and the two main systems of IP in the world are right now either the EU or um, the US. In the EU, they use geographic uh, indicators that are tied to geographic locations because they believe that um, certain products can only be best product produced in certain places, such as champagne, which is limited to whatever is produced in the region of Champagne. And it's because of the quality of the soil that cannot be found anywhere else. It's also the way that the lights fall under, you know, uh, on, on, on the soil, on the plants, and also uh, the climate and all of those things. And it's also part of the process of making the Champagne. So we have that exclusive product that is only from that region. That IP right belongs to the country usually. The country has fought for that right and is going to enforce it. So it's not up to the private uh, companies to do that. And typically, products that have a GI protection uh, are considered to be more valuable and they are more highly priced. Then there are the things that you own because they were saved preserved and passed down to you by your ancestors. And that's when you talk about genetic resources, traditional knowledge, and cultural expressions. And basically, um, those are the requirements usually for those types of properties, which is that um, it has been preserved over many years, and they would not exist unless there was that passing down of generations. The logic to provide um, sharing of profits from the, those resources is that the custodians over so many centuries of all those resources should be allowed to share in the benefits of um, the products that are derived from those uh, resources if somebody else from some other countries are going to commercially uh, exploit them. So if somebody comes, for example, to get some of your medicinal plants and then they make a big drug, but they used the knowledge and then the plan that is only from your country, um, if they would not have had access to that uh, resource and that knowledge unless they came here. And so the world had said, it's kind of fair if uh, you, may, you, may you may benefit from some of that uh, commercialization. One example that has been very successful, for example, has been um, some of the Native American tribes in the US. And in this case, uh, I showed case wild rice, which is sold at um, almost $14 a pound. And it's because of several reasons. The traditional seeds have more nutritious value. It's an old seed that uh, is just better. And then it's traditionally harvested. So it, it has a whole history around around that as well and then there's also um, they also brand it in a very smart way which is to say that they want to recover their lands that were lost uh, during the um, I guess when um, when the treaties were not correctly um, respected and so with all those factors it makes it, it makes it possible for them to sell it at a much higher price those were the the general tools that are used to, um, to protect different kinds of intellectual property, uh, which are properties of a mind, either from now or from your ancestors. And the reason why people use intellectual property protection is because, of course, you can make money out of that. And in general, so I tried to put down um, the ways that IP is making money. Of course, the, basic, the basis of uh, intellectual property being able to make money is that you own it. And because you own it, then you have a right to uh, transfer it, sell it, and then get a profit out of it. So it assumes that because you own your IP, then you can license it. 
most of the time. So for, so for patents, you have that exclusivity on that great new, new machine or invention. And uh, if you're looking for money uh, to develop it or maybe export it somewhere else, you have to make more of them, manufacture them, then you can look for investors. Because you have a patent, then usually investors are able to see, well, this is, this is a real new invention. There is um, a potential market for it and therefore they will be willing to invest money in it. And usually, during that process, um, there will also be some evaluation of uh, the pot potential price that you can sell the products for, right? And so chances are it's a high price machine or device or new invention that, um, that basically warrants making the investment. For copyrights, Usually what happens is that every time somebody uses your song or your poem or uh, they display your sculpture or your painting or maybe they get a copy of your uh, photograph, then you as the creator and the owner of the original idea, you're able to basically receive royalties and that's how you get money from that kind of, in, of creative uh, invention or creation. Then for trademarks, usually it's because the trademark does mean that it's of a higher quality. I mean, it's the quality that your company provides. Um, it's also something that um, means that people can easily recognize the product and therefore it's more likely that they will buy it. And so because of those factors, you will get higher prices usually if you have a good trademark and a good product. For GLs, TKs and CEs, uh, if you have ownership of those resources, then now there are supposed to be systems through which you should be able to, um, to get benefit sharing from uh, corporations that, that are interested in exploiting that kind of property that, that you have. So the question of course is, so why should you really look at IP for a decade of innovation here and now. And what is St. Lucia's competitive edge for regional, I guess, regional, maybe, leadership in a green tech economy? And um, so the reality of it, as you just saw at the fair that is outside, is that you have had a lot of um, investments, maybe from international assistance, into a lot of green tech uh, products and sustainable development products. So uh, there are actually many inventors and SMEs that already have products that are ready to be used right now, such as Carly's, such as um, Jade, I guess, the young man that we just heard. And, and um, not only they, but there's also, uh, I guess, a pipeline of other products and maybe other people who will be inspired. So you already have a community of people that are innovating. As part of, I guess, getting all those grants, what I understand is that there is a community, a community organization that has been created. And that community organization already has um, some history and experience with managing that kind of projects. And therefore, it's going to be able to get more loans, grants, um, provide, connect to technical assistance and all of those things. So you also have that piece of the ecosystem for an innovative um, community that is there. You have a government that is interested in innovation and then you have academia that is ready to also be of support. Uh, and then the whole community, such as all of yourself, seated right here now, are interested in um, I guess, in, in having more innovation and having a better future for St. Lucia. So given that you have this environment, it's, it's really um, having that readiness for um, an innovation uh, ecosystem in which IP, of course, will be one of the critical elements so that you're able to actually keep the ownership protect your IP and then monetize it in a way that will benefit you and the community. 
And finally, I just wanted to say a few words about uh, this organization, PIPA. Uh, we were invited because we've been working on global public interest IP since 2002. So we have 16 years of experience offering access to IP of the right size at the right place and at the right time. People only come to us when we need the services. We, we never do, I mean, we never provide services for uh, like just research and academia. We actually have clients that have real IP problems. And so what we do is that uh, we match them to, um, and or we use um, the services of pro bono attorneys to do some of our own uh, analysis and research. And we're able to use that existing resource of IP experts that are interested and willing to do pro bono work to decrease the cost of access to IP, which is usually uh, not very accessible because um, attorneys cost a lot of money and things like that. But thanks to a network of pro bono experts that in their, in their daily life, their job is actually to work on real cases with real clients, then we're able to, uh, to provide that kind of um, highly, I guess, um, sophisticated and complex and expensive expertise. And it's something that we hope to be able to offer to St. Lucia um, when resources may be limited, but the need is great to have um, that kind of technical assistance. So this concludes my my presentation, thank you very much. Okay. All right, intellectual property, trademarks, patents, questions, comments. Uh, tomorrow we're going to have a seminar on this and we're going to go into the law and we're going to go into it in some, a lot more detail. This is just a little teaser. Um, anybody, question? Anita James. Yes, and Anita James, NSC member. Thank you, um, Lifang, yeah, thank um, you. for your presentation. So you're saying in St. Lucia, we, we already have the laws necessary for, it, for us to patent. So can we patent a product in St. Lucia right now? Is it possible? Yeah. Yeah, and, and so I should explain that a little bit better. What I mean by that is that St. Lucia has patent laws. I mean, it has IP laws on the books. Then the question is always, do you have a legal system for it? Meaning that you, do you have uh, IP attorneys that are uh, experienced, we're working on IP, and do you have uh, a legal system that is ready to hear cases if there are problems with it? The, the, other, the other aspect of um, IP, I guess, is that a lot of it deals with international trade. And therefore, um, the other reasons people really want to patent or trademark or copyright is because they're ready to actually export to other countries. And so there's also that factor for St. Lucia, which is that it's not only about uh, the domestic market, but it's also that you may have inventions and innovations that are going to be of interest to neighboring to neighboring countries or countries that have similar circumstances, right? And in that case, then, um, it's not so much that there are patent or IP uh, laws in St. Lucia, but you just need somebody who has the expertise and the technical assistance experience to help you file in other jurisdictions. All the um, intellectual property uh, rights are territorial. It means that each country has the right to protect within their own borders. And therefore, when you want to enter a different market, and you want to have protection for your intellectual property in other markets, that's where you want to file. The reason why you have IP laws here is because when people come to sell things to you here, they want to know that their, their things are not going to be copied. And that's why you need your IP laws here. That's more for the foreigners, kind of. Although you can also file, um, I mean, you could file locally patents, but it's, it would only be applicable to the St. Lucia market, and you have to, to do the cost analysis, is it worth it or not? You probably want to file where you're going to actually sell and make more money. Yeah. Okay, so I had a question as well, but you partially um, answered it. You were saying that um, there's collecting that information and putting it in a database would um, 
let you know if that idea is new or not. So I was kind of wondering if that is already in place in St. Lucia, but I guess your question kind of, um, sorry, her question kind of answered that. Um, but the second part of my question would be, um, since I'm guessing that there's no database or something like that here in place already, there's the laws, but there's not necessarily that system, um, how would then somebody who creates, for example, a te technical idea, like sort of the greenhouse idea, how does somebody like that be sure um, that that's not already being done and then possibly you know, be sued for that or be vulnerable against something like that? Somebody from overseas um, um, saying that that idea is, has already been patented in another yeah, market. Exactly. So, um we, with, a, with a patent applications, there are several things. There are two main ways that we uh, look at um, patent applications. Sometimes it's the first people to actually file, and sometimes the people to who invent. So you will have to be careful about um, the jurisdiction in which you apply. Some of them will be, maybe somebody else invented it before, but you're the first to file anyway, so you're, you know, However, what happens is that, I mean, people are very logical, right? For example, let's say that um, Apple forgot to patent the iPhone in St. Lucia because they thought, oh, what are the chances? You know, we're never going to maybe sell in St. Lucia, nobody is going to compete with us or whatever. Then you have somebody else who comes up with a phone and then they call it the same thing. They call it the iPhone and they say, well, Apple doesn't have a patent on, <laughs> you know, with, I mean, it doesn't have, um, it doesn't have a patent. It, actually, it's not, it's not so much of a patent because the patent, they will, um, no, actually, it, it could work with a patent also. It's like, it's not filed here. So if it's not filed here, it does not exist here, right? And you could file it. However, what will happen logically is that right away Apple will come and then will say, hey, <laughs> well, now we're going to fight. And it's, it's a huge company, right? So. Logically, people are not going to really do that kind of things, except maybe in China, for example, where you know it's really worth it. But um, at any rate, um, the main thing is that I, yeah, I mean, I think most people do make logical decisions, and therefore, if they are going to file something here, for example, they will have some sense of uh, whether or not. Um, they actually own, own the thing, right? And then the other thing is, um, is that um, the reality of it is that most, most patents are being filed only in five jurisdictions in the world because those are the most, uh, maybe the bigger markets and they also have um, the better protections, meaning that if you really want to, um, to litigate uh, the issues, then the system is better. Uh, and, and those markets are like the US, the EU, Korea, uh, Japan, I think, and China. And um, so the reality of people actually filing in St. Lucia, unless you're a big company and you just file routinely and you don't care about the cost anyway. So I think a lot of big companies may do that just to make sure and as a routine thing. But I think for a smaller entrepreneur, the decision of patenting and where to patent is made much more carefully in terms of cost analysis. And then when you do patent searches, it does depend on what you have in your database. If, if a lot of people filed patents here and own patents here, then you will have a huge database. And when you search it, that's why it's, it costs more money too, because it, it costs more money to search a bigger database to know whether other people have already filed here and it's not new here. Right, but if it's but but if it is like um, if it's a very small place, then it will be very easy to look. I mean, has anyone filed anything like this before? If it's a huge um, country like the U.S. or even um, in the EU, you can collect, you can actually file for the whole EU. So um, those those places, there are a lot more inventions, and the database is a lot bigger. It takes longer, and it costs more money to actually look for it. The other thing that you can do about patents is that, um, and it's true for patents and uh, trademarks, you can, you can choose different fields or different claims. So we were just talking about honey. Honey, you can use honey for very different products. It can be uh, 
B venom for you know for um, I guess the the skincare products, medical products. It can be honey to eat. Uh, it can also be uh, honey to wax, maybe to clean things. So each of those different applications are going to be different claims, and uh, that also makes it. Um, it's it's kind of a. The more applications you have, the more claims you have, the more expensive it is because the more fields and uh, you are going to be searching. But on the other hand, the more possibilities you have to make profit too and to have more products under your name. 